good morning and welcome to the 24th meeting of the committee in 2014. Uh, everyone present is asked to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as they affect the broadcasting system. Uh, some committee members uh, may consult tablets during the meeting. Uh, this is because we provide the relevant papers in a digital format. Uh, we have apologies from Stuart McMillan this morning. Uh, Stuart Stevenson is attending as a, a substitute member, and you're very welcome, Stuart. Uh, if we can turn to agenda item one, uh, which is our second oral evidence session on the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill. We have two panels giving evidence this morning. I'd like to welcome the first panel, uh, Danny Logue, Director of Operations at Skills Development Scotland, uh, Stephen Kerr, Interim Head of North Community Health Partnership, NHS Lanarkshire, uh, Linda McDowell, Executive Director of Scottish Enterprise, and Superintendent Alec Irvin, at Licensing and Violence, Violence Reduction Division of Police Scotland. Uh, welcome to you all. Uh, would any of you like to make any opening remarks? No? In which case, we'll crack on with the first question. Um, Community Planning Aberdeen uh, has stated in their, in ev uh, their written submission uh, that the bill provides an opportunity to ensure genuine community engagement, consultation and active participation by citizens in identifying local needs and involvement in setting priority outcomes and how they should be addressed. Do you uh, agree with that statement and uh, what do you uh, think of the proposals in terms of community uh, engagement in, in this bill? Uh, Superintendent Nervin, do you want to go first? Yes, certainly. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I think from a policing perspective, I think one of the things uh, that, that's articulated in the, the Policing Fire, Fire Reform Act are the policing principles we established that we as an organisation need to engage with communities across Scotland in order to develop and drive services that meet community needs. Uh, as an organisation, we've already uh, est established a national consultation process that looks over 31,000 people in Scotland in terms of seeking their views at local community level. So in terms of the Act and the proposals within uh, this bill itself, actually, it uh, actually fits extremely well in terms of the intentions of the organisation to consult and engage and drive local service forward. Uh, in terms of police involvement and community planning partners previously, uh, partnerships previously, um, some areas, uh, the police presence uh, and involvement was greater than in others. Um, do you intend to ensure that there is uniformity across uh, the country in terms of, of participation? Yeah, absolutely, convener. I think one of the things that you would you would rightly see across uh, Scotland was the, the was the was the integration of policing services at community planning level. I think there's a, a long track, positive track history of community involvement and engagement in community planning, but I would agree that there are different levels of that commitment and engagement across the country, but it's certainly something that's at the forefront of our minds in terms of how we engage appropriately with community planning partnerships and drive towards common outcomes through the single outcome agreement. Uh, Ms McDowell, what do you think of the, the Aberdeen CPP statement? I very much welcome the statement and I very much welcome the bill. Uh, we're very committed at Scottish Enterprise to support community planning and we already sit on all 27 community planning partnerships with our most senior people uh, allocated to each of those partnerships within our region, within Scottish Enterprises geography. I also welcome the focus on, on the evidence-based approach that, that they talk about and, and real tangible outcomes that can be agreed by partnerships working together um, to line against a, a common goal, which I think both at a local and, and a regional level would be very welcome. And it's certainly areas where we have a, a lot of examples we've already engaged at that level where we can clearly see the opportunities around that table, uh, where each of us bring our own strengths, and we can then look at a single agreement where we can actually have business community involvement, local community involvement, key partners and stakeholders around the table to deliver real tangible outcomes. And I think that's very, very welcome. Thank you. Mr Logue? <coughs> Just to echo Linda's comments, but very much welcome the bill, and also recognise the comments, Convener, you mentioned from, from, from Aberdeen. And again, as a national organisation, we have been very actively engaged with all the local community planning partnerships and all the relevant subgroups that are associated with them. Because being a national organisation, we want to make sure that our focus in terms of service delivery and the outcomes that have previously been mentioned are reflected within our own local planning to make sure it's local needs that are actually addressed and we are flexible across all the 32 local authorities. That very much involved has previously been mentioned about that, that level of engagement at the community and stakeholder level across all, all areas. 
Okay, in, in terms of your um, written submission from SDS, uh, you say that uh, you're extremely happy that the bill recognises the valuable contribution uh, we can make to community planning by being proposed as a statutory community planning partner. Would you like to expand on that and tell us what that difference will make? Yes, the, the difference convenient it means because initially when community planning partnerships were first established, uh, SDS as an organisation wasn't it had just been formed as a result of the previous conjoining organisations where we, where we came from. So there'd been no... Um, reference or recognition to the creation of SDS and, and since then we've worked, uh, as I mentioned earlier, actively with all 32 local authorities in relation to how we can input into community planning partnerships. What we feel now is that uh, a formal recognition of us as a, as, a, as a key stakeholder gives us that for more formal involvement and a consistency right across all 32 because to date we're on 24 of the community planning partnership st strategic boards and we're on 32 of the local um, employability, et cetera, um, economic development subgroups. So this gives us a, a more formal recognition as a strategic partner and role that we can play in referring our, our outcomes from our local planning within the, the local CPP arrangements. Mr Kerr, please. Thanks, Convener. Yes, I can perhaps bring a local perspective as I'm here on behalf of NHS Lanarkshire and the North Lanarkshire Partnership. Um, I think we definitely welcome the, the opportunity to strengthen community planning and to, to make it more, more something that, that people have a, a clear focus on. I think that all of the partners um, are very keen to work in that way and uh, at times I suppose other priorities get, get in the way. But if we're really serious about our aims in terms of improving health and tackling inequalities, we need the full, the full input from all the partners and a much more rigorous look at the single outcome agreement and how it actually reflects the local priorities within the localities and indeed some of the sub-localities in our area. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Anne McTaggart, please. Yeah. Um, thanks, Convener, and good morning, panel. Um, you had mentioned within your statements um, the seriousness now as opposed to, I mean, CPPs have been around for a while and you have been involved in particular Ms McDowell, um, who's got involvement in 27 of, of the CPPs. Can you tell me why we would need legislation and make that statutory? What difference that that will make? Um, I think, I think um, perhaps in, in many of these, these situations where, where things are done on not necessarily a voluntary basis, but there's an expectation that people will participate and uh, across the country, you might see a variability in, in participation and in the success of the community planning partnerships. And I think putting it on a, on a, more, a more solid base will, will help to reduce that variability and improve the outcomes across the country. In what way, sorry, can I yes. ask? In what way do you think that will change? Well, in, in our own scenario, um, I think we have we, we would say that we have a very strong community planning partnership, but I think what we don't have is, is complete connectivity between the aims of all the organisations. And I think this, this would perhaps just make it more of a priority, even though it's a high priority just now, I think we could make it a higher priority and link it more clearly into the objectives of those organisations into one and make the single outcome agreement more reflective of the the needs of the communities. I think just now, in some areas, there's a tendency to have outcomes in the single outcome agreement that reflect existing requirements, targets, standards, etc., and maybe not so much of the actual specific local priorities in terms of inequalities and, and, and health. Okay, Anne. Do, do you want... feel then that there will be a difference made um, in community involvement then with the new CPP structures? And the legislation that will follow. To the others in a yeah. minute. I, I believe that there's an opportunity for that to be, that to be strengthened. And how will you do that? Um, in our own area, I think we are we are currently reviewing our partnership agreement. We're reviewing our structures and how we link with local communities, and we're beginning to bring a focus much more to defined sub-localities, smaller, smaller geographical areas, smaller populations where we think the greatest need is. And we're finding that bringing that focus is, is proving to be very helpful. 
But I think if, if, if there was a sort of statutory framework for the community planning work, then I think all the partners would be we'd be more likely to be engaged in a, in a stronger way. It's hard to, <laughs> hard to express what I'm trying to say, but that's, that's basically what I'm trying to say. Okay, um, Superintendent Irvin, you're itching to come in there, I think. Thanks, Convener. I, I think, in, in response to your first question about the strengthening of the legislation to make it more effective, I absolutely agree that that's needed. I think my experience at a national level would be that effective partnership working and collaboration depends on the individual rather than the process, so where you've got an individual who understands the benefits that working collaboratively can deliver in terms of outcomes, communities, it works pretty effectively. Where you see an absence of legislation, you've got individuals who, for whatever the demands are on them uh, in terms of their own internal organisation, I think it's less effective. So I think that, like, the strengthening of the legislation to reflect a more collaborative approach, a more uh, explaining the, uh, articulating the benefits of more effective partnership working are useful. And I think by doing that, I think what you do is you strengthen link into communities because I think that engagement and consultation part is absolutely critical to agree on what local action should be in pursuit of outcomes. And I think, again, I think there are some good examples at a national level where there's consultation, there's engagement in helping shape some of those outcomes, and I think there's an absence in other places across Scotland, and I think a consistency of approach would be exceptionally beneficial. Okay, Ms McDowell. I think also making it statutory gives people collective responsibility to make things happen. Um, I'm a great believer that it's people that will make things happen and maybe not structures. And clearly, I think this gives an opportunity for people to really rally around these local outcome plans, see some real tangible outcomes that can come out of that, and genuinely, collectively agree to deliver those. And for me, that's where you'll get the greatest, the greatest involvement in the community, both the business community and the local community. I'm going to play devil's advocate here, because you said people and not structures, and yet here we are having to bring forward legislation to try and improve um, a situation. Um, some uh, folks have said previously uh, that they feel that uh, some of the bodies involved in community pl planning partnerships uh, would try and push all of the responsibility onto the local authorities, uh, saying that they were the lead bodies, it was up to them to, to do uh, this, that and the other. Would that be fair? And why is it that we need these changes? And why is it that people thus far have not managed to, to make them work to the degree that they should in many areas? I can only honestly speak of my own involvement in the Community Planning Partnership um, in Perth and Kinross, for example, and that clearly isn't how it operates. And we have each agreed to map out the assets of that area, to look at it both locally and regionally in the wider Tayside area, and each partner then agree where they can help to deliver those outcomes that have been identified as having the greatest opportunity. Um, I, I genuinely do believe that sometimes you maybe need that structure to get people to come round the table, to then appreciate what they each bring to the table and where they can each play a part in delivering those outcomes and involving the local community. And I think where you've got very specific tangible outcomes, and we've lots of examples where we've worked with Team North Ayrshire, we've done some work in the south of Scotland and other areas in Renfrewshire, where partners genuinely have worked together to deliver those and at very little cost because it's people's time but people can then see the benefit of pulling together that collective resource to make a difference locally and again collectively that then makes a difference to the Scottish economy overall. You said that you agreed to map out assets and you know I was involved in a community planning partnership previously mm -hmm. which uh, agreed to map out assets but actually failed to deliver in doing that. Did you actually achieve that? We're still in the process of doing it, and we actually okay. have a number of workshops planned, uh, particularly around Perth and Kinross, and then looking into the wider Tayside region. So when so did that process start? It's been going on for about three four months now, okay. um, and we're beginning to see real benefits from actually being aware of what that asset base is, and indeed how it, bu it builds into the collective you know, picture for a sustainable growth in, in Scotland. Okay. Mr Logue? Yeah, just to pick up on the, the earlier question about the difference uh, in terms of legislation, I, I mentioned earlier we are on, currently on in 24 of the 32 local authorities at the CPP at the strategic level, but um, initially when, we, uh, when SDS was created we were in very, very few. We ended up creating a parallel structure called the Service Delivery Agreement, and that was our attempt from the SDS to try and align ourselves to to single outcome agreements that have previously been mentioned. And since then, I said, we've, we've now successfully been we're members of a very a large majority of them. And in fact, our chair, John McClelland, has actually written out to the CPP partners, uh, strategic boards that we're not on, to ask for an SDS representation. That we've had some 
early feedback on, on that as well. So I think back to the point about, I think formalising it help. I think it helps with that consistency, it helps with the collaboration that's been touched on earlier on in terms of having the, the key partners that are there. And also I think it's very worth mentioning that the, the um, community planning partnerships that I'm involved in, involved in quite, quite a few of them personally, is I haven't experienced any, any notion of partners offloading any of the responsibilities to local authorities. In fact, if anything, it's been very much about a collaborative basis about the different assets, the resources, the services and the priorities we have, because our local plans that we have within Skills Development Scotland are very much aligned to the single outcome agreement in terms of the accountabilities of partners within there. And that's why we, we've now been able to establish that devolved that res local resources to local partners in terms of what's actually spent within a each of the CPP areas across the Skills Development Scotland resources. Alec Rowley, please. Well, um, somebody might be forgiven for, 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 for listening to the evidence this morning and thinking what this bill is about is really just forcing public bodies to work together because currently they're obviously not doing that. I mean, what would your, your, your view on that? Because that, that sounds a bit like what you're actually saying is that we need to legislate in order to get public bodies within a given geographical area to actually work together. Mm -hmm. Superintendent Irvin, do you want to go first, please? Thank you, Convener. Um, I, I think, I'd go back to the point uh, I think you made earlier on in terms of that consistency across the country. I think we do have some very strong examples in areas where um, effective collaboration and effective working together uh, functions uh, very, very well. Uh, I think I would question the consistency of that approach across the country where, um, for a variety of reasons, um, there is no in, in, in inherent value seen in, in that whole process. Um, I, I also think it's quite patchy in terms of that good practice um, and I, I, I think that we as a public sector need to capture that good practice and try and promote it more effectively across Scotland. And I think the legislation perhaps provides a framework to enable us to do that uh, more effectively. Ms McDowell. I, th I think there's lots of good examples of where it works really, really well. I've, I mentioned earlier, for example, Team North Ayrshire, where we work with North Ayrshire Council and, and looking at the challenges that, that North Ayrshire faced. We've been building business capacity there. We've been looking at further investment into the area. We've been looking at town centre improvements. And they actually then formed uh, an economic uh, regeneration strategy uh, for North Ayrshire and also a board. And now we have a Team North Ayrshire, which was established in December 2013, which really looked at a one-stop shop almost for both the community, the business community, to come in and really, really look at the outcomes and the assets and the opportunities in Ayrshire. And I think that's a great example of where partnership working and, and at local community planning level uh, is actually achieving results. I could give you other examples in the south of Scotland as well and in Renfrewshire where we, we looked at economic exporting opportunities, there was more signposting to each other's services, it was making it clearer to the business people and to the local people about where to get help and support so that collectively you know, we did receive results but also that we had joint responsibility and collective responsibility to deliver where we each knew we had the expertise around that table to make things happen. Mr. Logue. Yeah, I think back to the, the, the question, I think the, one of the, a couple of points to make. One is, and it's already been mentioned, about the consistency across all areas, because it does, it does vary, and I think there's, there's a need for that, that greater consistency. And linked to that is about that genuine collaboration in terms of all the key the partners that are around the table, because in the, the many of the, the CPPs I'm involved in, the membership differs in terms of organisations and individuals who, who are involved. So you, you do tend to get quite a, a mixed view, a mixed, mixed involvement across them across the areas. And the, the final point I think just to add, to add to what Linda was saying again is about it's about that, that that genuine engagement of partners. So you all feel you've got an equal contribution to that discussion around the table. You're not there as a kind of a sort of a, an afterthought or another partner. Yeah, there's, there's a genuine ex example of, of us being involved in one of the areas that we introduced uh, two years ago was co-commissioning in relation to establishing skills pipelines across for young people across each of the 32 local authorities. And that involved us co-commissioning um, for example, the employability fund and some of the, some of the services that we deliver. So there's, there is that genuine involvement of local stakeholders in defining what services that we would provide within that local community. Mr Kerr. Yeah, I, I would agree with, with um, the, the points made earlier about, about variation and trying to, trying to bring, bring all the partnerships up to a, a standard where they're working in partnership. Um, I think there are 
as people have said, there are very many examples of where, where it works well, and, and indeed in our own area in, in Shorts community. We've got a healthy living centre, and all the partners are contributing to that, and it, it tackles lots of, lots of related issues around physical activities, um, activities for young people, helping them to access services and leisure. Crime in the area has gone down, youth disorders has gone down. We've got community transport in place that helps people in terms of employability. We have a lot of health inputs in terms of health promotion in the area. We've got lots of uh, activities and, and social opportunities for older people. We've got early years work going on. We've got a food co-op where people can not, not only access food but learn cooking skills. And uh, that helps to tackle things like obesity. And uh, we have... I don't, I don't want to, to stop you, but you know, we get a flavour of, yeah. of, of what there is. Alec, do you want to come back? Yeah, I mean, I've got a couple of points, but if we pick up, if we pick up on, on that point and where, where we come from there, I think some of the criticism that has been levied previously looking at community planning partnerships is that there is a lot of projects out there. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily a view that I hold, by the way, but there's a lot of projects out there that community planning partners could, could say... You know, in my own area, there was a Living Well project that involved other different partners, and, and it was often used. But the criticism is there's a lot of projects, but that doesn't necessarily show joined up public services. And that, that seemed to be a criticism. And I just wonder, you know, what is it in terms of making the, the partnerships more transparent? For example, could it be the case that actually every budget, whether it's in a local authority, a health authority, or whoever, that it actually clearly references where that budget fits within the community plan and the, 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 the strategic outcomes um, that, that, that are being suggested. Um, you know, how, how do you actually, at the end of the day, demonstrate and, and make transparent that these public bodies are actually working to a common agenda, whatever that may be? Mr Kerr? You would, you, would, um, you would expect the current single outcome agreements to do that to, to a certain extent in terms of identifying the common priorities that we're working towards. But I, I agree that there, there may well be other, other ways of doing that and certainly linking the objectives of each organisation to the community plan and the single outcome agreement would be a good way of doing that. And the, the finances also um, may, may be an identification of where, where contributions are being made. Before Frienders comes in on that, I mean... Could you reach a stage where each organisation has to bring its budget to the Community Planning Partnership Board and, and demonstrate how that budget is actually delivering for, for, for the, the, that area? Mr Kerr? Well, we're, we're beginning to, to do work around joint resourcing in our, in our partnership, and I think that it would be perfectly reasonable to expect that, that each organisation could report to the Community Planning Partnership on how, how it's spend of its budget or how its activity contributes to community planning. Can I come in there as well? Because I think this is extremely, an extremely important line of questioning. And one of the things which the committee has been told previously in terms of um, outcomes, and let's stick to health. Um, the community planning partnership has agreed an outcome on health. And yet, pre uh, yet the uh, NHS board's heat targets are something different than that outcome. Um, I think the point that Mr Rowley rightly makes is where is the budgeting emphasis of the NHS going to be in that regard? Is it going to be to achieve that heat target or is it going to be to achieve that outcome that's within the single outcome agreement? Um, I think the, what it should be is the resources and the, the attention of the, the organisation should be on achieving what's in the single outcome agreement in terms of improving health and reducing inequalities. But I do agree that heat targets have a tendency to, to, to mean that resources and activity are targeted towards those specific targets and not necessarily towards an outcomes-based approach. So I, I don't quite get what you're saying there, because you're saying both things at the same time, that the priority should be um, the achieving the single outcome agreement aim, but at the same time you said that, you know, that heat, heat target well, is... Well, I suppose what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that, and from a purely NHS perspective, sometimes our resources are targeted 
specifically at achieving, at achieving heat targets, when in fact the, the outcomes for individuals might be improved more by taking an outcomes-based approach linked to the single outcome agreement. So, for example, if, um, if you looked at delayed discharges, for example, and I'm not saying this, this happens universally or, or in any specific location, but it's quite possible that in trying to achieve a delayed discharge target that people might be discharged from hospital to a care home, whereas if, they, if they'd had a period of time to, for further assessment, they might have been able to go back to their own home. And that's something that we are, we are working on locally in, in Lanarkshire. But I think certainly some, some heat targets can drive resources and expertise towards a very focused point in a, in a person's journey through the health healthcare system. Okay. Um, do you want to come back in there, I think, I think that's an excellent example okay. that you actually gave with the late, delayed discharges. Can I just finally switch it a bit and back to this sort of engagement of the community and involvement of the community? Um, I don't know if, you, if you're aware that, that under the previous Fife Constabulary and, and their, their former Chief Executive, Norma Graham, they set up um, a model there that, that basically how it worked was they would, every two months they would go into a community, do a community meeting, pick up three, the three priorities of that community and then two months later report back on, on the progress that they had made. And, and they led the way in that. I mean, the local authority and others were, were sort of following behind. Um, and then obviously the changes came about. But that model in terms of actually engaging the community and getting on board the community priorities. And that's why I, I really wonder when we're talking about single outcome agreements and we're talking about this, this high level outcomes, are we in the same breath talking about engaging the community and what is the role of the community in all this? Superintendent Irvin. I, 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 think, I, I think the example from Fife is an exceptionally good one because I think it does it is an, a, an example of effective policing where there's, there is good community engagement that drives uh, local priorities to make safer communities. Uh, again, there are other examples which I think uh, follow that similar model. And I think in terms of how we're going to, you know, as organisations work in the public sector, how we deliver sustainable solutions, we have to deliver that type of model. I think at a strategic level within community planning partnerships, I think there are examples where there are investment decisions taken that kind of build projects and programmes. But um, my experience of those are that they, they, because of a disconnect between that type of local service that we're seeing is really effective where policing, uh, if I use that example, is speaking to local people about what they want to see at a community level is actually there's a bit of disjoint between some of the programmes that exist that are driven strategically and I think the challenge for us all about how we join that up because I think unless we're delivering that type of on-the-ground service that is visible to people um, and it is actually understood about how we're driving our business uh, through uh, community engagement and shaping what we're trying to achieve. I think um, there will always be a disjoint between what community planning is seen at through communities and what we are actually doing in terms of working on the ground. Okay. But then we just want to, keep, to comment on that, that relationship between we talk community planning um, and the, the word community would suggest people, but actually is it, is it a much higher level? Or are we... Are we are we kidding ourselves in the sense that somehow this is this is about the community setting the agenda? Yeah, and I think it's, it's both. It's at the strategic level and also at the community level, as you, you mentioned as well. It, certainly, our particular organisation has been heavily focused on local delivery because we've often national organisations can be criticised for having a national focus and it doesn't really it doesn't reflect local priorities and even very much it, it pains to, to reflect that. And that's been done through a number of uh, areas. We have. Um, ongoing customer evaluation, local stakeholder engagement with well with, with, with partners and with individuals about the services that we provide. And one good example of that has been the, the local employability partnerships where the third sector, for example, are heavily involved in those local employability partnerships of what's actually delivered locally and other community organisations as well. And again, that reflects back to the example I gave earlier about the co-commissioning then of the services, particularly employability funds. Um, and how we deliver them, and how we deliver them locally. So that's really, really important that we that we do that. And finally, I think it's important that we reflect two things. One is local performance in terms of how we deliver our services to to, lo to local areas, and also we have a very um, detailed communication strategy and plan that reflects SDS as a as a national organisation. But more important, what we're doing locally, and that forms, for example, on the basis of. Um, 
partnership agreements with local schools, parent-teacher councils as well, DWP are involved, to make sure we do get that communication that comes out to local partners and stakeholders. Ms McDowell? I think, from Scottish Enterprise's point of view, our main engagement has been with the business community, and clearly that's, that's a, a focus we will continue to have, because the business community, I think, until now, have found it quite difficult to engage with community planning partnerships, again, perhaps because it's been very high level, and I think with the evidence-based local outcome plans, I think it will be easier to, for them to engage. We can then work with them to hopefully create jobs in the local area, to build a business capacity, to compete for other opportunities, and even to escalate it up to a regional area where, again, you can look at travel-to-work patterns for people. You can look at various skills assessments that SDS are, are delivering for industry. We've got industry advisory boards and regional advisory boards, which, again, is involved in the business community. And I think this opportunity will allow them to have a much greater involvement and a greater role in delivery of those um, tangible-based outcomes. OK. Um, Superintendent Irvin, you, uh, you talked about the strategic level of the community planning partnership. During the course of that, I would have expected to hear you know, um, how uh, local ward policing plans form the basis of the outcomes that community planning partnerships um, are, are actually after. Because at the end of the day, this is a proactive community engagement in terms of coming up with those plans. And yet, at that level, at that CPP level, we've not heard you talk about them at all. Yeah, I think that's an important part of how we deliver our business. And it goes back to those, those 353 ward plans for Scotland are based on that consultation process that I spoke on earlier on. Those local, those local war plans in turn feed the local police plans for each of the authority areas. And again, we should see a linkage between the local police plans and the single outcome agreement. Uh, I think um, the, the, that, that structure there uh, allows us to have a degree of confidence that what we're doing is shaping service um, that helps inform our partners and helps us collaborate more effectively with our partners as, uh, as well at a community planning level in terms of the delivery of local service. I think it goes back to me in terms of the, 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 the kind of different accountabilities about how those local police plans uh, link into the Scottish Police Authority plan and the, the National Police plan. While I think they're, they're positive, I still think there's, it goes back to that dilemma, like the health sector, about what, what has precedence in terms of how we're pursuing outcomes at a local level. I think they, add, they all add to that jigsaw and enrich the picture. But uh, it, it then becomes of that, that, that kind of, um, and not unusual, that kind of operational decision making in terms of how we balance the, the, the need to deal with national priorities versus the local priorities that are driven through that process. So I'm saying uh, that this legislation um, will have to make all of your organisations um, rethink um, possibly governance structures, but certainly. Um, some of your own priorities, as you see it, to fit in to the priorities of communities and community planning partnerships. Would that be a fair statement? Yeah, I think make? that's a fair statement too. Yeah. And, and how do you think your organisations are going to, to look at all of this after this, this bill is enacted? I, I think there's an inherent challenge, and it goes back to some of the funding challenges that we face. Uh, policing budget goes to the Scottish Police Authority, who make investment decisions based on that money. Uh, but if we're talking about giving more power to local community planning partnerships to require investment from local partners, there, there's then a dilemma there for local police commanders who don't control the purse, purse strings in terms of how much money comes in at the local level, level, how they actually then support the community planning agenda uh, locally, um, given the degree of control that they actually have. And I think that will create a challenge within the organisation. I think it's probably a positive one, challenge. One of the things about community planning partnerships is they were supposed to end some of the duplication that went on. So why, in terms of, as Mr Rowley has talked about, that scenario of pooling budgets, why do you think you need extra resource when, in some think, cases, I, I, you could be actually saving quite yeah, a bit of money? Sorry, can we, I don't mean we need additional resource. And what I'm saying is that the investment model for the organisation is that it goes okay. to the SPA, who then determine how that money is funded. So, for example, if a local police commander in Fife or another authority is the, kind of, the, the key component of how we engage at community planning level, what they can actually control locally in terms of the amount of money that they get to invest, they'll have a resourcing level which will, by and large, be the people involved, but not necessarily a financial contribution. It's how, if there's an expectation from a community planning partnership that we have to invest money in it, that will create an inherent difficulty. 
uh, in that because the commander actually doesn't, in fact, actually control the purse strings of how much he has to spend at a local so level. So we're going to have to look at uh, a situation where the budgets are devolved to, to the local commander level, which uh, you know some folk would uh, quite like to see. Um, uh, Mr. Kerr, do you want to go next? Yeah, I think um, we we do have we do have uh, community planning structures that, that are replicated in, in localities. And each of those areas has a locality action plan, which is reported back to the partnership. So I suppose there is a link there with, with what's actually important within communities. But I think that there's a, there's a new player in, in town um, coming up, and that's the Integrated Health and Social Care Partnerships. And I think it will be important that the strategic needs analysis for, the, for all of the communities and the strategic plans of the Health and Social Care Partnership, the Community Planning Partnership, the NHS Board and the local authority actually are reflective of, of one another in terms of the priorities and actions. So there will have to be governance changes to make yes. this work. Okay. Uh, Ms McDowell. Convener, I don't see the priorities of Scottish Enterprise Training uh, changing as, as a result of the bill. Um, we're an opportunity-driven organisation. We're an economic development agency. And, and really our I'm not talking about priorities, Ms. Ms McDowell. I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm talking about governance arrangements to make it easier for you to focus uh, into cooperating within community planning partnerships uh, and uh, getting the outcomes that that partnership wants yeah. uh, rather than some of the scenarios where you probably have other targets to meet elsewhere. We're already involved in, in 27 community planning partnerships, and I think our, our involvement would continue at that same okay, level. Let me ask you a simple so question ever. about the involvement in those 27 partnerships at, at this moment in time. How much uh, money uh, has Scottish Enterprise put into um, individual planning part, community planning partnerships at this moment, moment in time? I can't answer that question, convener, specifically, but I could find out for you. However... I think what we're doing, our resource is, is very flexible and it's based on, as I say, being an opportunity-driven organisation. So we need to better understand the assets and the opportunities in each of those community areas to make sure they then collectively contribute to the economic growth for Scotland. And um, a lot of our contribution around that table is in staff resources. I wouldn't like to think it would be specifically around a, a percentage of a budget because I think, it's, it's uh, as I said earlier, it's around people bringing expertise around that table to make things happen. Let me, and, let me change the question it slightly. Very much led by budget. Let me change the question slightly then. Uh, how much money um, has uh, Scottish Enterprise given uh, to community plan planning partnerships uh, to fulfil their priorities rather than Scottish Enterprise priorities? I can't answer that specific question because uh, I don't know the exact value of it and I wouldn't like to... I, I think it would be guess. interesting for us to get a flavour of that. Yep. Um, Happy Mr. to Logue. that later. In, in, excuse me, uh, can be, in, in terms of uh, governance arrangements, there wouldn't be, we wouldn't see, see any necessary change in, in governance arrangements because our focus has been, as a national organisation, but we deliver locally. Our structures are local. A local teams, a local planning is all done at the, at the community planning partnership level. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're involved in a large number of community planning partnerships uh, at a strategic level. But... Um, as I mentioned earlier, the chair has written out to the other local authorities in terms of being members of the, the local authority CPPs were not being involved in. So very much your focus has been at the local level. And um, we are now able to report the uh, deployment of resources at each local authority level. In fact, we'll be including that in our annual uh, report this year for what we spent uh, in each local authority last year. And that would include all the skills programmes. And it also includes all the delivery of the careers service for each of the, the local authority areas as well. Okay, Stuart Stevenson, please. Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, we've just had uh, the words focus at local level, and that's been a theme uh, throughout many of the contributions. But just uh, listening carefully to what people have said, I've heard, from example, from Mr Kerr, reduce variability. Uh, from Superintendent Irvin, we heard a similar remark. From Danny Logue, I heard the words greater consistency. Um, are we actually being told that Castle Douglas should get exactly the same as Castle Milk? He wants to go first in that one. Superintendent Irvin. I, I, think, I, I think it depends on the makeup of the community. We've spoken a bit about some of the assets that exist there, and also look, I think we also need to look at the evidence base that exists from a policing perspective, the levels of crime and disorder. 
uh, and, 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 and what actually exists on the ground in there in terms of community cohesion. Would we expect, from a policing perspective, would we would expect a, a community police officer and other response officers to operate in that community. But I think in terms of level of investment, in terms of, of, of um, that level of investment, the number of officers that we actually have dedicated to that area, there's clearly going to be a difference based on the level of demand that we have and what the evidence base suggests to us. So you are saying that variability is good if properly managed? Absolutely, sir, yes. And is that the opinion of the whole panel is nodding heads. Right, well, that, that, that's fine. We don't need to ask everybody else. But I, I just think it's quite revealing of thinking that I'm able to write these words down that suggest that the bill is a way of imposing uniformity. Would community planning partnerships have the view that actually their contribution to delivering for their communities is to have absolute variability to ignore or place in a secondary position national priorities and elevate the local. And specifically in that context, should single outcome agreements be determined before the CPPs determine what they're going to do or after? <laughs> Mr. Kerr. Yeah, when I spoke of variability, I was really speaking about variability in the level of engagement in community planning. I think you're absolutely right in that the, the, amount, of, the amount of resource, the amount of, of effort and energy that goes into, into a local area should reflect the needs of that population. Mr Logue? Yeah, again, when I was talking about consistency, two, two things were, were not involved in all CPPs. There was a, there was a, there was a plea in there about, about that. And, and secondly, they, they, they do vary in terms of the makeup, the membership, and, and also the... the um, the maturity of the, the partnership in terms of, of, of the outcomes. But the other point I think it's worth making is that uh, we are all keen to see, rather than uh, uh, all different organisations having different plans, are all, that there's all a line of sight in terms of the single outcome agreement. And in terms of priorities and resources, we then work with partners to reflect what are the local priorities and the local needs in terms of Castle Douglas or, or Castle Milk. And there's a number of factors we would build into that along with our community planning partners in order for us to deploy resources in terms of skills or careers advice that we would, uh, we would uh, supply. Sorry, I don't want to let you off the hook on this. Uh -huh. Should the CPP decide what should happen before the single outcome agreement, or are they in the business of implementing the single outcome agreement? Which comes first? For me, I, I, sorry, Convener, apologies. I, I would said the, the, the CPP in terms of identifying. There are national priorities, but I think how you've got to then deploy them and address the local needs and local issues, and to be able to, be able to, to then gather and ring fence all the various resources of the partners that are in that, that in, operate in that particular area, because we also, as an organisation, deploy our resources in terms of needs, sure, sure. and we've got to make sure that's aligned with all the other partners in terms of what they're actually doing within that local outcomes focus. Well, let me... Um, you know, we can pick up others' views as well, but just sticking with yourself, does this bill carry with it the danger by creating a national framework that it elevates the decision-making upwards rather than making it driven from the bottom upwards? Is, is that danger there, and how do we manage it if it is? Mr. Lowe. Right, thanks. No, I, I, don't, I don't think there is a, a danger there. I think because of the, the extent of the, the CPP, the single outcome agreement focus has been for the last number of years, has established mm. that, that framework within the local areas. It's just trying to address some of the issues we've all talked about in terms of consistency, in terms of that focus on, on local outcome agreements, and in terms of, back to the point about resources as well, in terms of how we deploy them locally. So I, I still see this, this, there is that local uh, maturity and that local involvement of all the partners in, within each of the CPP areas to address a lot of the, the local issues. I don't see it as a danger in terms of it being come down addressed on high. So, for example, Skills Development Scot Scotland get a letter of guidance from Scottish Government every year to say we're asking SDS to deliver X. How we deliver that X is through local... Yes, we know what the priorities are, but our, our uh, annual operating plan would then we'd take that locally and discuss that with the CPP partners in order to make sure it fitted in with the local needs, local priorities, and the other plans and resources that are being deployed within that area. Okay. Others? Ms McDowell? That's a similar approach that, that we would take to Skills Development Scotland, but I think the variability question is, is really based on where the assets and, and the opportunities lie, and I think if we can use that evidence-based approach to really then see where those tangible outcomes lie, and, and it can both complement and, and, and um, enhance you know, the single outcome agreement based on that local knowledge and that evidence base, then I think there's a win-win 
In, in, in fairness, I think you were the only member of the panel I wasn't able to write down. <laughs> Thank you. Superintendent <laughs> Irvin. I think, um, I think in a positive way, as soon as you start engaging with communities, you introduce a degree of variability because different communities want different things in terms of what they expect from public service, and I don't think that's anything we should shy away from. Would you in fact agree that the evidence of variability is likely to support the argument that there is good local engagement. Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, I don't think that's, an, as I said, I don't think that's a negative thing. I think as soon as you start engaging, consulting with communities, it drives services in a different way. I think the challenge uh, around about that is, and, and how does that consultation and engagement then drive your single outcome agreement? Uh, I've seen some good examples where a lot of the outcomes identified in single outcomes have in fact been driven by consultation. On the other hand, there are others there that I've seen where it's simply been driven by a set of strategic priorities put on the table by the organisation. And it's how we make sure it's the right way around in terms of being community driven in terms of outcomes. John Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Uh, I wonder why we're here if things are working so well in terms of the uh, CPPs that we need legislation to actually improve things, with the exception of maybe Mr. Logue's case the SDS get a seat around the table in the community planning partnerships. That's not the experience that we're hearing when we're taking evidence from communities. The experience quite clearly contradicts uh, what we've heard today. Uh, and Mr Stevenson made reference to the top-down approach or the bottom-up approach. And clearly, three of the panel members here today uh, belong to national organisations that have national priorities set in terms of the work that they do. And Mr Logue outlined that he gets a letter from the Cabinet Secretary for Finance in terms of his organisation telling them what the uh, priority X is. Uh, if that's, where, where, where do you think the conflict that we're picking up between communities and the CPPs, uh, the direction of CPPs, the single outcome agreements, and the other work the CPPs are doing, uh, why do you think that conflict seems, uh, well, what we've picked up apparently exists, the communities feel they are being ignored in the decision-making process and they have very little control or very little say over the priorities of the community planning partnerships? Mr Kerr. Um, I find it difficult to answer that other than from, from a local perspective. And as I say, we have... We have local community planning arrangements in each of our six localities in North Lanarkshire, each of which is, engages the community forum in that area, and each of which has a local action plan that reflects the local priorities that, that have been agreed with, with the local population. I don't sit here for, for one minute and say that, that uh, we are a perfect example, and I would say far from it indeed. And we, we appreciate that there are, there are many improvements that we can make, both in terms of how we organise ourselves and how we engage with communities and how we focus into some of our more deprived areas. But I guess that the, the answer to that question would, be, would, would lie within each of the partnerships. Let's uh, look at North Lanarkshire because I think one of the uh, points that Mr Wilson is making uh, was probably most prevalent in North Lanarkshire in a committee visit to Cumbernauld. Um, where folks didn't feel they were involved in the process. A lot of folks didn't know about the local planning, community planning arrangements, certainly didn't know anything at all about the community planning partnership. So where does that failure lie? And I have to say that most of those folks that we talked to were very, very heavily involved in their communities in one way, shape or form, with many of those folks involved in many, many organisations. Yeah, I think that uh, the, you know, as I said, the arrangements aren't, aren't by any means perfect, and I'll take that, I'll take that information and, and look at it very carefully. But as I say, we do engage with the community forums in that area as part of our process around community planning, and indeed in the NHS specifically. So if there are, <clears throat> if there are still per perceptions that there's not enough engagement, then perhaps we need to improve on that. Mr. Logue. 
I think one of the one of the issues is in terms of that that level of, of engagement that Stephen's mentioned. There, particularly community forums, and I'm involved in a number of CPPs, Western Martinshire, and, and others as well. There, there's actually involvement of community forums and community representatives at the on the at the, at the CPP. And I think the other, the other uh, interesting thing I've seen a number of developments has been around some of the substructures which I alluded to earlier on, particularly around employability and some of the other issues where there are lo local community representatives actually on the local employability partnerships. They can they can hear and discuss about what kind of services will be will be delivering locally. So I think it's down to quite often it's about that community engagement that, this, that Stephen talked about, but it's also about the actual involvement in the membership of community planning, not just the, the strategic bodies, but in the number of the subgroups that address some of the local outcomes that are there to make sure there is that level of stakeholder engagement. In particular, I mentioned earlier on about third sector involvement. There's some really good examples where the third sector have been heavily involved in in some of the, the, these local these local priorities and local focus. Ms. McDowell. We, we're really a, an evidence-led organisation and therefore the community involvement is mainly with the business community and, and we have a strong track record of involving the business community around various forums to look at the services we provide. So we're not actually engaging with the local community as such as far as our remit is concerned, but hopefully the engagement we have with the business community will benefit the local community by way of, of job creation or you know, building business capacity, etc. For me, the participation requests I think that might come from the community to Scottish Enterprise, certainly from, from this bill, I, I'm not sure they would be of a huge volume, but we certainly would be happy to look at ways in which we could involve the local business community were that to be something that they felt they could participate in. Mr uh, Superintendent Irvin. Uh, I think, Convener, if, uh, if I can use another uh, North Lanark, for example, where uh, in, in terms of the Gautherapple area just outside Motherwell, where there is an exceptionally effective model of joined up public sector delivery linked into community engagement, um, which I think um, you could hold up and say it meets all the principles and all the intentions of the of the contents of the bill in terms of how it wants to strengthen community links, uh, public service uh, and the community planning process. Um, and I think that there, there lies a challenge for us all in terms of public sector delivery, because I think there are some exceptionally good examples. Uh, so there's one that exists, if you've got this dilemma between what it looks like in Cumbernauld and what it looks like in North Motherwell, why have we got that? Because it's the same local authority, the same policing partners that are engaged in the same process. There's certainly a communication issue in there in terms of how we're articulating some of our intentions within that area. But I think, uh, for, for, uh, I think what that does, it highlights the need um, for, for us all in terms of that engagement process with communities to make sure that it's fit for purpose and tailored to meet the local community itself. Mr Wilson. Thank you, Convener. The follow-up question is really around the, the issue that the implied issues arising from the bill mean that the may be that CPPs are looking to national bodies to contribute funding to the delivery of services within the CPP area. Uh, given the, Mr uh, Superintendent Irvin's earlier comments about the budgetary uh, constraints on local commanders uh, and Ms McDowell's comments about the con financial contribution from Scottish Enterprise would be hopefully be through staff time devoted to working the CPPs. If there was a demand made by the CPP partners to actually ask national bodies to contribute more to local funding initiatives uh, so that they could, uh, the CPP could direct the work uh, in, of those organisations or work around those organisations. Do you think that would be generally uh, viewed as favourable or do you think there may be some concerns about particularly existing tight budgets in organisations and CPP's demands on those budgets as they currently stand? Mr Logue, do you want to go first this time, please? Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Camino. Yeah, I mentioned earlier on about the, the letter of guidance which we received, from, obviously, from, from Scottish Government. That lays out the priorities for, for SDS within any, any given year in relation to whether it's careers advice, modern apprenticeships, employability fund, regional skills assessment, skills and investment plans, etc. And what we do, we take, we take those asks and those resources that we have, and many of them are in the shape of, of staff as well, and others have to support businesses in terms of modern apprenticeship programmes. 
and others of, of employability funds. In terms of any um, resources in there that are, that are flexible for other local deployment, they're all already committed in terms of priorities we have. Where we do have the flexibility is on the ground in terms of how we deliver those career services, how we deliver the employability fund, regional skills assessment, skills investment plans. And the big focus, I think, around that is, yes, the finance and the budget and the resources are important, but very, but even more important is about the focus on local outcomes. It's about what we're trying to achieve with all those pooled resources rather than always necessarily the, the discussion of, of pounds, shillings and pence. And if we're all signed up to a, a local uh, outcome agreement, single, a single outcome agreement that specifies in details, here are the outcomes, and how do we actually achieve those outcomes? What we as an organisation would be doing is saying, well, here are the resources we have to deploy within a particular geographical area to meet those, to meet those local outcomes. Ms McDowell. I, I think for Scottish Enterprise, if you're trying to achieve a, a sustainable you know, economic growth for Scotland, then again, we need to go back to understand locally where the assets and, and the opportunities lie. I, I would be disappointed if we put a percentage of a budget you know, against actually trying to deliver on what was a, a, a local outcome improvement plan, because I think if you get the right people and we identify the assets and opportunities, then resources should be challenged to make the most of these, regardless of, of where they lie, so that collectively for Scotland we, we have a, a, a benefit to, to the, the growth of the Scottish economy. And I think there would be a danger if we said 10% of the budget had to be spent on that then what happens if the opportunity demands 50% of the budget? We really are an opportunity-driven organisation, and, and I'd like to think our resources were uh, fed into where the, opportunity, the greatest opportunities lie for the growth of the Scottish economy. A little supplementary from Stuart Stevenson there, then, please. Um, given that I'm someone who doesn't believe that we should restrict ourselves to everything that we already know will succeed... What proportion of your budget are you knowingly putting aside for the high risks in support of community needs? I can't answer that, that question. Again, I'd have to find out the exact well, figure. Let me, let me phrase it more broadly. Do you think there is a figure? Sorry, could you say that again? Sorry. Do, you, do you think there is, do, without knowing the specific amount, do you think that is something you're prepared to do? I think we would, again, we'd, we'd look at where the, the assets and, and the opportunities lie and, and be driven by where those, those greatest opportunities are for, for growth of the Scottish economy. And clearly, you know, that's really where the, the public purse should best be spent to achieve that growth, to create jobs, and, and hopefully the benefits will come okay. in turn to the local communities. You've opened up a can of worms, Mr Rowley. <laughs> in Scottish enterprise terms, if, if the key economic opportunities sit within the central belt and the key economic drivers of the Scottish economy is, is Glasgow, Edinburgh and that city region area, is that not where your priorities are therefore going to be? No, definitely not. I mean, certainly, the, the, if you look at what's happening within the, the seven cities in Scotland, there, there are opportunities there to drive the, the growth of, of the entire Scottish economy based on that. And I talked earlier about um, what was happening in the south of Scotland, for example, um, where they've been looking at pulling together the, the work of the South of Scotland Alliance and the South of Scotland Economic Forum to really drive through the M74 corridor, looking at open up Stranra, for example, as a... As a a sailing gateway. They're looking at, you know, various uh, economic development projects around that whole area. So it, it's really trying to look at where the assets lie in the total for Scotland, because um, it's all quite different. You've certainly got assets in the around the cities, but you've got assets around various regions and, and, and other areas. That I think collectively, you know, each of the local communities within the, the geography of Scotland can benefit from. Okay, uh, back to Mr. Uh, Wilson's original question. Uh, Superintendent Irvin. I think, Convener, um, I don't feel qualified to answer that because I think that's a question that should be levied at the SPA. Uh, however, what I would say, I think if you look at the policing principles within the Fire and Reform Act, I think it drives us towards delivering services at a local level, and that's, that should be absolutely integral to policing. And therefore, I think it's a challenge that the organisation should be up for. Mr Kerr. Yeah, I mean, whether, whether or not there's a, there's a percentage... Um, identified or, or a number identified. I think that's, that's perhaps immaterial in the sense that in a community planning partnership, <clears throat> if we identify the, the correct needs in the correct communities, then I think it's about the partners bringing whatever assets they can and also identifying and, and, and harnessing the assets within the communities themselves. Okay. Mark McDonald, please. 
thank you, convener. I mean, most of the ground ha has been covered, but I'm interested mainly in what CPPs can do to drive down inequalities in communities and between communities. So I guess I would sort of put this into three questions in one. Are CPPs doing enough to reduce inequalities? What more can be done and how can that be done? Mr Kerr, please. Um, I guess that the simple answer to that is, is no, because we still, we still see um, health inequalities in our, in our communities. I think we've, we've done a significant amount of work to, to improve some of those, those issues. I think we're now beginning to see <coughs> that, um, certainly in our own partnership, we're beginning to see the need to do much more focused work highlighting very specific areas, very small populations, where the inequalities are perhaps at their, at their highest and putting much more of a focused attempt into those areas and certainly increasing the, the community engagement in those areas to try and bring about improvements and help people to engage in, in these activities. Well, before we carry on, specifically in terms of the outcomes that CPPs uh, are, are drawing up, do you think, or well, firstly, is, is there work done to make sure that these are essentially uh, linked to the inequalities agenda and the reduction of inequalities? Uh, and where that is not happening, should that be essentially every outcome should be tested against what impact it will have on inequalities within communities? Yes, I think um, we, we, we do do that in the sense that we have uh, locality health and wellbeing profiles that identify a range of, uh, a range of indicators that would indicate that the areas are, are less equal than, than others, and we, we do focus our attention on those. But I think all, all of our plans should be, able to, should be able to drill down into our plans to see how the, the inequalities agenda is, is focused. An example last week uh, at committee here, Mr Kerr, uh, about the priorities of local people versus the priorities um, of, uh, of organisations. Um, the example was that the priority for the health service in one of the areas, uh, deprived areas that Mr Macdonald represents uh, was tackling mental health. Uh, the priority for the health service uh, was getting folk to stop smoking. Uh, and the community, of course, said it would be much easier uh, to be able to stop smoking if some of the mental health problems within the community uh, were actually addressed. How much cognizance do you take of local communities uh, and folk within those communities when coming up with these uh, priorities in local health areas? Well, part, part, of it is the, part of it is looking at, at the evidence in, the, in the, the wellbeing profiles that just gives you the specific information. But there is, definitely, there, there is definitely work going on in the local areas to work with the local community to identify what their priorities are. We've currently got an initiative in, in the Craig Newt area where all the agencies are in working and very much with the community, with a lot of community engagement. And we're hoping that that might be a model that we can use in other localities within North Lanarkshire. Okay, back to Mr. McDonald's original question about tackling inequalities. Mr. Logue, please. Yes, uh, thanks, Kevin. I would recognise Mr. McDonald's comments in terms of more we can do in inequalities. And I think that the suggestion there about inequalities is impact assessment and all outcomes should be undertaken rather than seeing as there being a, a separate bolt on activity within, within a number of areas. And if you have that PM meeting right across, uh, across all the um, focus of the outcome agreements, I think that would help in terms of equality impact assessment. The, the second thing I think is worthwhile mentioning is a number of organisations, we all, we all have uh, action plans and equality action plans and priorities, it's to make sure within the sing single outcome agreement process they're aligned into one within that local community. And the, the third point I would make is about, uh, back to the uh, point I, I mentioned earlier about resource deployment and to make sure when we're prioritising resources to areas, they do uh, tackle issues in terms of uh, equalities. And I mentioned earlier on about the employability fund is one example we have within and careers advice in terms of how we deliver locally and making sure they're weighted according to local issues and local challenges. Okay, Ms McDowell. I think it's in answer to the question of whether they're doing enough to address inequalities. I think there's always more 
we could do in that respect. And, and clearly, we've, we've talked about health inequalities and, and other things that Danny's mentioned. But I think if we do test every outcome, then I think that'll be one way to try and make sure that we address it as much as we possibly can. And I'd welcome you know, quality impact assessments, etc., being carried out from each of the outcomes of that uh, local improvement plans. Superintendent Irvin. I think this is one of the, the critical fundamental challenges um, for community planning partnerships in terms of how they, ta they tackle inequality. Uh, inequality for me means it's a motivator for crime, criminality and its social behaviour. But if we could tackle those underlying causes, I think it would make a significant difference to communities. I think what I would like to see in terms of what more we can do is probably a kind of shift away from for some organisations, a drive towards annual targets, because I think tackling inequality requires like a longer term, more sustained approach. And I think it's how we measure and hold ourselves to account against that type of drive rather than short term targetism. Mr MacDonald. Yeah, um, I think it follows on from the, the, the question my, my colleague Stuart Stevenson posed around the, the Castle Douglas versus Castle Milk. Um, and, you know, we hear a lot about postcode lottery and complaint about postcode lottery. The postcode lottery that concerns me the most is the fact that if you're born within a certain postcode, your life chances are dramatically different to if you're born in another postcode. That's the postcode lottery that concerns me. So is, is there a need maybe to move from looking at postcode lottery to postcode priorities? And is there the nerve within community planning partnerships to have those, those focuses in terms of where resources go and where priorities go into these postcode areas where life chances are so dramatically lower uh, than in other postcode areas? Superintendent Irvin. Yeah, I, I think we're already starting to see that shift. I think if you look at the single outcome agreements in their current iteration and that focus in place, I think um, that, that there, there's more, uh, I suppose, a more robust discussion around about what, where, where the actual level of demand is and how we invest in resourcing. Um, there are examples already at a national level um, in Frasenborough, Edinburgh, uh, Renfrewshire, where some of that discussion is taking place within the community planning partnership about how you actually drive forward your business based on that level of demand and trying to ta well, take it back to tackling inequality. Because there is inequality, what can we collectively do to deal with that? Ms McDowell, please. I think, yes, I agree. I think it's moving from a postcode lottery to postcode priorities. And again, it's, it's back to, you know, understanding where the assets and opportunities lie. And, and particularly from our point of view, being able to help that job creation that, again, can hopefully improve the quality of life of the communities in those local areas. Mr Logue. Yes, again, just to, to echo that and to, to talk about the, the postcode priorities. For, for example, one big area we look at is school leaver destinations. Young people, the 54,000 approximately school leavers leave every year in terms of those destinations into a positive destination, university, college, modern apprenticeship training, etc. How do we make sure we address any of those inequalities and any of those priority issues there by making sure that we deploy our resources to meet those particular needs locally? And it's not just for one single organisation, and that's the benefit of having community planning partnerships and a single outcome agreement. How do we collectively pull that focus and that priorities to deal with those in each of the postcode areas you mentioned? And Mr Kerr, please. No, absolutely. We need to focus on the areas of greatest need and where the greatest inequalities are. And I think that's a process that we're, we're starting to see more happening now. OK. Mr. The convener was whether... Um, w w I think we all recognise that. The difficulty is, is that the, I think we would all accept that there is a a difference between those in the most need and those with the most capability to express desires and needs yeah. of their communities. So the question was really not whether we recognise that need, but whether there is the collective will within community planning partnerships to make that step change in terms of where resources go. Mr Kerr? Yes, I think, I think that's, there is that will locally, and I think that's why we're we're beginning to focus really very much more on these, these communities where, where people perhaps have, have the greatest needs, there's the greatest inequalities, and perhaps they're, they're the least vocal in terms of their needs as well at times. Does everybody else agree that there is that collective will? I see nodding heads. OK, thank you. Uh, Cameron Buchanan, please. Thank you very much indeed, convener. Um, somebody said earlier that people, not structures, make things happen. And I was very conscious of the fact that how can the CPC... CPP be perceived as an extension? Is it perceived as an extension of local authority? It needs not, not to be perceived as an extension of local authority. Could you comment on that? It's been partly answered by my colleague, Mr Rowley, but 
could you comment? It, it's, it is perceived as an extension a bit of the local authority and its people rather than the structures. Mr Logue? I, I, I refer to that point uh, earlier on about the, 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 um, our, our particular involvement and I would say certainly from the, the community and planning partnerships that we are involved in, there has been a genuine level of engagement from the local authority and other partners to make sure that each organisation locally plays its, its, its contributing role area in the area and, and not being given outcomes from the CPB but to actually help shape those particular outcomes in each of the, the community planning partnership areas. So I would definitely see it as, a, as, it as very much a, an involvement of other partners, other organisations within than that, um, than that, that CPP infrastructure. Superintendent Irvin. I think, uh, I, I think there needs to be leadership in terms of community planning partnership, and I think the Local Government Act and the whole structure drives towards local authority being that leader. Uh, I think without leadership, there's no governance. Without governance, there's no, uh, there's no activity. So I think that's a critical part of what we need to strengthen at local level. Ms McDowell, please. I think if all the partners are, are clearly explicit in what they bring to that table, then it is people genuinely who will make these things happen um, because they will agree to have collective responsibility to deliver on those local outcome improvement plans and those tangible outcomes that clearly will make the, the greatest benefit. Mr Kerr. Yeah, as well as the local community planning arrangements, we work very hard to make sure that our frontline staff, for example, district nurses, are, are very aware of community planning. So as, when they're doing a, a dressing in somebody's leg, they'll be talking to them about you know, employability, they'll be, talk, they'll be doing a financial assessment, they'll be if there's fuel poverty in the house, they'll be identifying that. They'll be referring people for, for uh, community safety checks by the fire service, etc. So I think we're trying to embed it in all, in all the staff groups within the organisation. Cameron? Thank you. I think it's the perception, not the reality. And that's what I think you said there. It's the perception that it needs... And leadership is the key in that. Would you not agree? Lots of nodding of heads. Thank you. Yes. Is that you, Cameron? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, finally... Um, the bill itself, uh, do you think it includes all of the right partners within, uh, to be within CPPs? Are there any additional bodies uh, that you would like to see uh, round the table? Uh, and are there any bodies which you think should be removed from the bill? Superintendent Irvin. I, I think what's included in the bill is entirely relevant. I also think there should be a degree of flexibility, which I think the, the bill does include for local authority partners to identify who's relevant to sit round the table. Ms McDowell? I do agree as well. I think the relevant partners are there, but I would like to see a stronger emphasis involving the business community. OK. Mr Logue? Well, one issue we mentioned earlier on about the third sector involvement, which has been addressed. I think the other issue as well is about the involvement of DWP, given the, the resources that DWP actually bring to the table in relation to right, the, the priorities that, that, that they have, which is very much in partnership with, with others, including ourselves. I think we'd be welcome. Uh, very quickly, Cameron. More involvement in the business community, Ms. Nadal. What do you mean exactly by that? How would you, what business community is missing? Well, I think just now within community planning partnerships, you know, the community, the local community are involved, but I think because of the high level nature of the community planning partnerships, that generally the business community find it quite difficult to find a way in which they personally can engage. And I think if we made it much more explicit what that mechanism would be within the bill, then I think you'd find much more of the local business community wanting to participate in those discussions and indeed in how they can help implement you know, the outcomes from that plan. Mm -hmm. Eric, please. No, I don't think there's any need to, to specify any, any others specifically, but I think you know, locally we would, we would generally welcome any, any partners who are relevant to the agenda that we're trying to address. Okay, can I thank you all very much for your evidence today. Um, I suspend for a change of witnesses and we'll commence again at uh, 25 past, please.
Um, uh, thank you. Uh, we now move on to our second panel for this morning. Uh, I'd now like to welcome Jim McCafferty, Junior Vice President of the Institute of Revenues, Rating and Valuation, Gary Clark, Head of Policy at the Scottish Chamber of Commerce, and John Mundell, Chief Executive of Inverclyde Council. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Would you like to make any opening statements at all? We'd John, like to make one please. if I may, if you don't mind. Thanks. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for uh, inviting me along to give some evidence this morning. Uh, I fully support the principles of the bill itself. Uh, obviously, it's trying to achieve uh, a, a lot for local people. Uh, and obviously, the whole thing is about uh, our services being community-driven and designed to meet users' needs. However, uh, I think the bill itself will bring certain challenges, especially in this time of austerity. Not all communities have the capability to take advantage of the provisions within the Bill. This is particularly true for disadvantaged and marginalised communities, and it could lead to an increase in inequality if the partners do not succeed in the aspirations of the Bill. Resources are required in order to ensure the effectiveness of the Bill. Funding is key to increased capacity or building increased capacity in communities, especially the disadvantaged communities. And there are also resource implications for councils and local partners uh, in terms of officers responding to participation requests, as well as providing money to set up allotments and support uh, uh, other aspects of the bill. Of particular concern is the ability of community groups to take full financial responsibility uh, for the assets passed to them and the sustainability of the project when costs arise from repairs and maintenance to buildings uh, or where key participants no longer want to contribute to the project. Uh, local authorities will be expected to provide financial and professional support throughout this. And obviously, when we're reducing resources over the next two or three years, that's quite a challenge. Uh, but nonetheless, I certainly support the aspirations of the bill. Thank you. Uh, Mr Clark, do you want to make any opening statement? Uh, only to uh, thank the committee uh, for the opportunity to, to address you uh, on this bill. Uh, our primary um, interest in the bill is with regard to the, the effects on non-domestic rating. Um, but of course, uh, we are also uh, very um, interested in the, the aspects of the bill, which would potentially allow the business community to take a more active uh, role in uh, local democracy. Thank you. Mr McCafferty. Uh, just uh, again to thank the committee for inviting the IRRV here. Uh, yes, uh, as, as you would expect, my interest is in part eight of the bill, so it would be interesting to compare and contrast maybe the views uh, between us. <laughs> Thank you very much. Of course, this uh, session is looking at the main uh, at part eight uh, of the bill. However, uh, I'm quite aware that members may have uh, some questions, Mr Mundell, uh, about part two with your good self, and I, I, I won't stop members from uh, doing so. But can I start off with, um, with part eight? Um, and can I ask uh, what potential advantages uh, could result from this power? Mr. Clark, would you like to go first, please? Yes. Um, first of all, uh, we um, have looked at uh, the, the response of the Scottish Government to last year's uh, consultation on the future of non-domestic rating uh, in Scotland. And obviously, one of the key aspects to come out of that uh, was the power of local authorities uh, to implement their own uh, local reliefs uh, and exemptions. Uh, to uh, potentially assist businesses in, in their area um, and incentivise business uh, at a very local level. That's something that's to be welcomed. I think that um, uh, it's something that probably has to be looked at uh, in conjunction with um, the Business Rates Incentivisation Scheme, uh, which has had a, a, a bit of a bumpy uh, ride over the past couple of, uh, of years uh, since its introduction. And uh, I think if local authorities are going to take full advantage and pass on uh, potential benefits uh, to local businesses uh, as a result of the powers within uh, this legislation, uh, then they will have to be sure that there is uh, an incentive for them to do that. Um, and particularly, I think they will be looking at potential financial um, incentives to do it. So in other words, I think that many local authorities will be looking to perhaps apply uh, reliefs and exemptions uh, in order to perhaps encourage more businesses to, to, to come to the area, to set up in the area um, and potentially to uh, increase uh, 
um, their resources as a result of that. But that would only happen um, if business, the business rights incentivisation scheme uh, is operating uh, effectively. Uh, and I think um, there has been some progress on that this year, but it, it is a scheme that has had a, a bumpy start. Mr McCafferty, please. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, convener. The Institute welcomes the local flexibility and uh, also, I think, the opportunity for better community building. I think um, listening to the first set of uh, uh, first session uh, of, of your committee hearing today, I, I noticed the difference often between a business community and a local community. And I think through proper consultation about what could be done with this relief between the local businesses and the local community, there's a real chance to move things forward. It might even shed some light into the darkness of the local government budgetary process, which in my mind would uh, do no harm at all. There are, however, drawbacks, and I'm quite sure we'll come to those later in the session. Okay, Mr. Mundell, please. Well, to increase fiscal power for local government is a good thing. Uh, there are existing mechanisms in place to help support businesses, and uh, I do wonder if there is an added advantage with the proposal in here uh, within the bill. And, and the reason I'm saying that is if we are trying to incentivise businesses locally within our area, uh, there are other opportunities through business grants, etc. Uh, and bearing in mind that uh, any, uh, the revenue uh, goes back to central government at, at the moment, I'm not so sure that uh, there's a major advantage from a local government's perspective. But anything that will help business start up in a local area has to be a good thing. Uh, the other thing that's in the back of my mind as well, if we all start uh, giving free incentives uh, or uh, alleviating business rates for businesses, attracting them to different council areas, uh, there is a risk of, uh, obviously, you're increasing competition. That's potentially a good thing too. There is a risk of a downward spiral, I might suggest. Do you think there's a particular um, advantage in, in this power uh, for disadvantaged communities? Often, um, uh, in, in many of our uh, poorer areas uh, right across the country, there are empty businesses, some of which have been empty um, for a long time. Um, and often the fact that uh, these premises are empty or that there are no, uh, no, no local shops stop folk from moving there and thriving there. So do you think there's an advantage in, in terms of, of this being enacted uh, for disadvantaged communities. Mr Mundell, if you... Yeah, yes, I do. I, th I think any incentive to help people uh, in disadvantages, uh, disadvantaged communities uh, develop skills or build businesses, small, medium enterprises. And bearing in mind, I certainly believe that uh, we need to do much more for small, medium enterprises and encouraging people from disadvantaged backgrounds to, to set up in business. So anything that will help them do that has to be a good thing. I'm just not so sure that this is necessarily uh, the only way to do it, especially bearing in mind councils do have powers to, to help local people through grants or whatever at this moment in time. And I'm not sure what the specific advantages are, uh, and I'm not wanting to, to, to say no to this uh, because it increases flexibility, but I'm not so sure that's the only way to do what we're trying to achieve. Mr Clark. I think it is a useful tool in the box. I mean, uh, as others have said, there are other uh, methods uh, which can be used to incentivise um, uh, conduct of business within uh, a particular area or in particular uh, sectors. But um, I think what this power would do is to allow um, a local authority to fine-tune uh, the uh, non-domestic rating system in their area to perhaps target a specific area, target a specific type of business that they want to encourage, um, target individual, potentially could be individual streets in an area, or individual communities within an area. And I think that's an, a, a, a definite advantage to uh, this particular measure. But it has to be seen in the context of the wider, both non-domestic rating environment and, uh, as has been mentioned, uh, other incentives that are available to businesses for, for different reasons. Thank you. Mr McCafferty, please. Thank you. Picking up on the other incentives and, and indeed other reliefs, I, I, I wonder about um, the partial empty relief uh, that's given in a reduction of rateable value via Section 24A uh, of the Local Government Scotland Act 66. That 
would be in some ways in direct competition to some uh, possibility of relief in, in this area. And I could see local government might be drawn towards this type of relief and away from the 24A relief because the 24A relief will possibly impact on the business rate incentive side of things. So I, I can see that the, the, the two things might be in conflict with one another. However, we do welcome the idea of having some kind of relief that can be targeted to specific areas and indeed gives the councils, providing they don't, do not tie themselves up too tightly in, in, in setting their schemes, to be much more flexible to the individual one-off type of event. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, perhaps Mr Mundell might care to address this first and then Mr Clark. How many businesses in Inverclyde did not proceed with uh, business development because of business rates in the last five years? Mr Mundell. I can give you that uh, specific answer just now. I can give you that so, detail. Right, okay. So that suggests that that is not such a big problem that it is assumed any prominence in your entry. Would that be a fair comment? Uh, my personal entry, but uh, obviously one of my colleagues uh, deals with these types of things all the time. So. Uh, generally, the uh, amount of business development within our area is not good enough, and it probably never will be. Uh, we need to make sure that we do much more, and any tool that we can actually bring to the toolbox will, will help. I'm, I'm just trying to test whether this particular tool really is addressing a problem you're experiencing. That's, that's what I'm trying to test. And while I accept and understand um, that the coalface experience of this lies not on the chief executive's desk. I take from the fact that it's not on your list of priorities that you're interesting yourself in, that it doesn't seem to me to be a particularly big problem for Inverclyde. I'm only asking about Inverclyde. Well, well again, you're asking about the specifics. There's a whole range of issues that uh, uh, do uh -huh. come to my desk and I am particularly interested in and it's down to employment, especially yep. employment for yep. disadvantaged communities. And anything that we can do through our community, our community planning partnership, uh, we, we are uh, obviously mm -hmm. doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I actually think we are having a degree of success in that respect. But as I said earlier, I don't think it's anywhere near enough. Now, this particular uh, uh, power that's going to be brought into to the bill, uh, I've already mentioned, I'm not so sure that uh, it's necessarily the silver bullet that uh, we need. Uh, and I do think there are other mechanisms that we're using through our community planning partnership uh, uh, with partners at the moment through grants and all the rest of it uh, are helping. Uh, and obviously in the backdrop, we've always got to bear in mind, depending on the scale of the businesses we're trying to attract to the area, the state aid rules as well. So that's something else mm -hmm. we have to bear mm -hmm. in mind, the level of grant that we can give businesses. But uh, at this moment in time, the specifics of business incentives or whatever through uh, uh, business rates uh, is not something that is on my desk all the time, but it's in the mix of a number of ingredients that we need to, need to resolve to help businesses come to our area. Right, let me reposition the question a bit for the Chambers of Commerce. Um, if we were to ask business, uh, would they benefit from a reduction in business rates, we get a 100% positive response. So let's accept that and not go there. I wouldn't expect the committee to hear specific business names for commercial confidentiality reasons, obviously. Are the Chambers of Commerce aware of any specific developments that have been kiboshed by the presence of business rates at their current level, whether in the generality or in specific areas? to put any decision uh, on the basis of not proceeding with, with, with one project or another at the foot of any one particular uh, uh, cost pressure. But the fact is that cost pressures are affecting sure. businesses uh, very strongly, uh, continually in, in the current environment. Uh, and also cash flow is a major issue for business as well. In that context, business rates are usually the number two or number three cost. Uh, for many businesses. Um, clearly there are a number of businesses that benefit from the small business bonus scheme and for them it's not an issue um, at the moment. But uh, there are many businesses out there who are facing cost pressures, facing cash flow issues and their number two or three cost uh, after staffing, sometimes rental, is business rates. Therefore, 
any measure which tackles that number two or three cost to that business uh, will free up uh, resources within that business to invest. Let me just test what you're saying there, because I, I got the sense that you were leading me and the committee to the idea of using this mechanism to support businesses that already exist. And I instinctively, might be persuadable, feel uncomfortable about that. It seems to me were this to have a value, it would be much more related to making something new happen and enabling the cost-benefit analysis to just cross the boundary to create sustainable business. And I, I, I really want to just pressure you again. Are you hearing of specific examples where just that ability to nudge across the boundary would mean that actually more businesses would start. I'm, I'm, I'm not opposing this, by the way. I'm merely yeah. asking a line of question <laughs> I, I, so that we can get the case yeah. on the table. I, I, think, I think there's two aspects. I think both um, supporting the creation of new businesses uh, and sustaining existing businesses are both very important. Uh, and I, you know, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether we should be prioritising one over the other. Both need to receive uh, a high priority because clearly existing businesses are potentially growing, employing more, uh, employing more staff, uh, new businesses. Yes, we need to, to provide incentives there and there, there are some incentives within the, uh, the global um, scheme that the Scottish Government already operates to, to support uh, new businesses coming into properties, for example. Can I just finally um, test in what you said there, what, what, what you appear to be suggesting is there be merit for existing businesses getting the support when there is an intention to create new employment. Uh, I take it you're not making the case for supporting continuity well, of employment. Uh, well, I mean, continuity of employment or creating new employment or investing in a business to perhaps extend the premises to uh, open up new um, uh, areas of operation for that business. All of those things require investment from the business mm -hmm. uh, and all of those things uh, therefore impact on the costs of the business. And anything that will reduce the cost could incentivize. But uh, the cost of, of making activities. change. Well, the cost of investing in the business, whether that's in new services, new yeah. products, making new change. staff, yeah. um, or, or, or securing existing employment, all of those things require investment from the business and, and business rates what, what I'm saying there is that that is one of the leading cost pressures on, on many businesses therefore if we uh, attack that uh, particular cost then we can assist businesses in doing any of those things right and is the institute got anything to say on this just just one one thing uh, convener uh, the uh, situation is about any rate relief um, given the nature of uh, the how the, the setup of properties are with a, a high level of rental, um, rentally occupied properties. It is to make sure that the relief goes to the business that it's intended to rather than seeps into the landlord's side of things. There's plenty of evidence, mm. particularly in the mm. 1980s, the enterprise zones in England, uh, how they did not perhaps bring as much to the table in the, firm, in the promotion of businesses as they did to help landlords select their properties, which in, in itself is, is no bad thing, but it's, it's to consider what, what the aim of, of any relief is. Well, just very briefly, convener, do you think the bill as currently constructed actually is more likely, if this is adopted by councils, to help businesses as distinct from help landlords, who are rarely anybody's favourite person? I think in any business rate relief, there is a, a true danger in that some of it will, if not initially, at rent review times, yeah, end yeah. up with, with the landlord rather than the business themselves. And I, I see that there, there's an inherent danger with this relief so, as well. So, so could the bill, therefore, I don't know if this is legally competent, so just do forgive me, um, could the bill, therefore, 
prohibit this being a consideration in rent reviews? Would that be a, or am I making this up and stretching too far? I, th I think that would take us in, into rent rent legislation, uh, and I, I'm not. I don't feel competent to cover that. But I, I, it would well, be I a most hard certainly one. am not. So that's <laughs> a for sure. Hard one to deal with. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Alec Rowley, please. No. Um, good morning. Good afternoon. Good morning. In terms of the, I note that the Federation of Small Businesses draw the comparison with England where these powers already exist and make the point that, that they're fairly neutral in the sense that rarely are they actually used. Um, and it's difficult, certainly in the current financial climate, to, to see where, where local authorities would have the resources to be able to finance this. And therefore, is this really just a bit of a toothless um, piece of legislation that's been put in by a government um, who would not have any of the, the, the cost to bear and, and, and the knowledge that the local government most probably would not be able to finance it? Mr Clark. Yeah, I, I think certainly, um, as I alluded to in, in the opening um, remarks I had earlier, um, it's difficult to see what incentive local authorities would have simply to, to spend money to no, you know, to no end other than to benefit um, a number of businesses in their community. I think what they would want is to see something, um, some return from that. Um, certainly the, the business rates incentivisation scheme which the, the Scottish Government has put forward um, potentially allows local authorities to benefit from if, for example, uh, local authorities choose to, to, to reduce um, rates for particular businesses uh, in their area and attract more business or new businesses are created within that area and are paying more, uh, more rates as a result, then BRIS would allow uh, the, the, the local authority to retain a proportion of that. But clearly there's been teething problems in terms of setting that up because of the um, levels of expected appeals, etc., cetera, in, in, in the first year of operation. Um, but I think as that progresses and as local authorities become more able to benefit from additional economic activity in their area and the proceeds of that, I think that's the point where uh, this additional flexibility to allow local authorities to incentivise business in their area could result potentially in a positive return for that local authority. And that's when I think it would become uh, more attractive uh, to local authorities. Mr. Mandel, do you want to? Uh, I just support what's uh, been said just now. I've not really got anything to add to uh, that particular point, but any grant or support that would be given by the Com Community Planning Partnership or indeed the Council would have to be tied to some performance measure uh, so that we actually get some transformational change through that process to help the businesses grow or indeed attract the businesses to the area. Uh, Mr. McCafferty? I would see that it could feed into the single outcome agreements at some point in the future. Okay, Alex. So if we were looking at this in terms of community empowerment, would, would the logical conclusion not be actually to allow local authorities to set the, their own non-domestic rates in their own areas, given that they are the local elected bodies in those areas? Um, what would the view be on that? Mr. Mundell. I, I personally think that, uh, again, going back to my earlier statement about uh, increasing fiscal powers for the local authority so that the resources can be applied in a more effective way to the most disadvantaged or whatever, uh, I think is a good thing. And obviously the rate boundage uh, issue is important through that. So. Mr. Clark. Uh, we believe that the, the uniform business rate does have uh, very strong advantages uh, in being applied throughout Scotland, uh, but the ability uh, for local authorities to make adjustments to incentivise business in their area um, would be a definite improvement on uh, the current system. Mr McCafferty. I think that whilst it's an attractive option to go for uh, localisation of, of business rates, uh, it would have to go hand in hand with some equalisation policy on local government funding. Otherwise, as, as was mentioned earlier on, the central belt may very well prosper uh, to the detriment of the rest of the country. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. 
Can I maybe follow up on that? Because um, the, the proposal in the bill, um, North Lanarkshire Council has suggested that, uh, it, that may create a race to the bottom. Um, do you think that uh, allowing local authorities to set their own non-domestic rates may lead to a race to the bottom, as North Lanarkshire has suggested that this proposal might be? I actually Adele. made that comment myself at the start. Uh, I think that is a risk. Uh, increasing cross-boundary, local authority boundary or community planning uh, partnership boundary uh, competition uh, obviously creates that potential risk of uh, trying to compete to attract the businesses to one particular area. And obviously that might have an impact on a, uh, on a regional area and it's about making sure that that's done in the right way. Uh, my own view is that the bill is focused on the most disadvantaged communities. Uh, and I think that's what local government and the, the public services are all about, is trying to equalise disadvantage. Uh, and, I, and I think what we need to focus on is trying to get those that are unemployed, been long unemployed, in the most disadvantaged communities into some form of employment. And if we can help them generate their own business to start with, uh, upskill them, I think that's an excellent thing. But there is a risk of a downward spiral uh, where we're all competing in, against each other for the same potential businesses to, to come to our areas, respective areas. Thank you. Mr Clark, please. Um, in, in terms of the race to the bottom, I think that's one of the reasons that we do, you know, I, we, uh, the current uniform business rate is, is something that we would, we would be prepared to, to, to stick with. But, um, but giving local authorities um, the power to um, make specific measures that would uh, specifically address issues in their own areas, um, which potentially this legislation uh, could do is something that uh, we would certainly find attractive. I mean, I think we do need to sustain businesses that are already out there, help them to grow, and, uh, you know, as, as, as uh, Mr Stevenson has already mentioned, uh, encourage the creation of, of new businesses as well, um, because it's, it's the combination of those circumstances that are going to give uh, Scotland the best economic, economic opportunity. So um, I, I think the most sensible route is, is to allow a degree of, of local uh, incentivisation to meet particular local needs, um, but to maintain that within the broad spectrum of a uniform business rate. Thank you. Mr McCafferty, please. The, the race to the bottom is part of it, and I, I can see that as, as a, a real danger. But there's, there's something that happens after that. If we go back to the strong connection between rates and, and rents, what we would get after that, if, if you had an area where rates were reduced for a period of time and you couldn't contain the behaviour of landlords, what would happen is that the rents may very well increase, which will be picked up the next time there's a general revaluation and the base, the tax base or the rateable value base would increase in that area. So I, I agree uh, with Mr Clark and Mr Mundell about the dangers of it, but there is a phase two in the long term. I, I wonder, um, in, in 2011, 57% um, of businesses in Scotland either paid zero or reduced business rates, um, which is a fairly significant number thanks to the policies that have been put in place. Have we seen since that point the introdu introduction of the small business bonus and various other uh, incentivisation schemes? Have, have we seen rent rises uh, because of, of these, uh, uh, these uh, rates being reduced? I, I think Any evidence at all? Th there's only anecdotal evidence in, in, in some types of, of property. That, that where there has been evidence in the relationship, and, and why there isn't evidence might very well be the overriding impact of, of, of the recession, but where there is evidence in the perverse behaviour of a relief upon uh, rents is within the charitable retail side of things with the 80% mandatory relief uh, that goes out when, when there's sufficient evidence prior to the recession of landlords from the private sector not being able to compete to, for, on rental bids for uh, retail outlets um, in certain areas because they were effectively outbid by charities who knew that they were going to be getting a cushion on the right side of it. Thank you. Anne McTaggart, please. Okay, uh, thanks. And still, good morning, panel. Um, are there any changes what could be made to the provisions to enhance 
the power and thereafter more likely for it to be used to be for it to be more user friendly, accessible, transparent. Mr. Mundell. Uh, I can't think of any at this particular moment in time. If you're talking about specifically the uh, the business rates, uh, I'm, I'm not in a position to give you an answer on that one. Eric. I, I think um, the act is, or sorry, the, the bill is um, uh, fairly wide ranging in terms of the, the possibilities within it, and it gives a, a fair amount of leeway to local authorities. So, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have any specific um, no. worries about the, scale, the scope, rather, at the moment. Yeah. Uh, Mr. McCafferty, please. I, I do wonder if, uh, going back to a point I, I made earlier on about seeing in a locality a single community rather than a business community and a, a non-business community, can we bring the two of them together? Because we already have mechanisms where there's consultation with the business community, and you could say in the wider sense of things, every time there's an election, there's a wider uh, consultation uh, with, with, with the community. But how do we get people together to recognise the interests of a single community in an area? Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Anne. Uh, Cameron Buchanan, please. Thank you very much. Mr. Mundell, you mentioned earlier about monitoring businesses for performance. How do you, how do you monitor a business for, or, or the uncertainty of it for performance? Uh, my, my comments specifically related to uh, a council, a partnership uh, providing some form of a grant to a business. And basically that grant would be tied to some kind of outcome. I uh, either going to uh, expand, uh, the money may well be for some form of an investment in uh, equipment or an ex extension to a property or assistance with moving to a different property. Uh, basically, we would like to see that uh, uh, the proposed outcomes through the business plan will be met. And basically, we would, if we are offering a grant, we'd like to see that there is some return on that investment. Thank you. Um, I was also going to ask about, you spoke about um, the fact that uh, grant relief to any types of ratepayer businesses as they see, see fit. Would that include things like employment, uh, you know, uh, Silicon Valleys and in business parks and things like that? I'm just concerned with this race to the bottom. That How do you, how do you grant relief to, to businesses? This rather overriding condition of granting relief to businesses seems to worry me. I, I can understand why. Uh, and again, in the context of this particular bill, which again, going back to what I've said about disadvantaged communities, uh, where we can focus help and support within a particular location uh, or place, uh, I think that's an important uh, 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 issue, uh, an important matter, and it will help us as partnerships to, to develop a particular community area. So that's on one hand. On the other hand, uh, again, normal processes would be adopted in terms of uh, uh, bigger business, but again, through Scottish Enterprise, who were here earlier, as you, obviously, uh, there are uh, approaches that they uh, apply and mechanisms they apply to help attract businesses to different, area, different areas. We've just had a success with a, a new business, an American firm coming to our area uh, with the prospect of 500 jobs. And again, that's through support through Scottish Enterprise uh, and, and grants, etc., through, through that mechanism, as opposed to the council. Okay, yeah, I was just gonna, can I just add can one I other point? Another point. You, what, for example, if you've got something like a business park in one area and a business park in another area and they've got lower rates, do you anticipate that you would uh, try and match those rates? Or do you, I mean, that's, that's a disadvantage. I see people might move because business rates are a very high percentage of uh, businesses, you know, business costs. That, that, that's, a, that's a concern attached to yeah. a race to the bottom. Uh, and I'm not quite sure how you square that circle, uh, because again, you, you might succeed for a period of time and then somebody else uh, uh, adopts a different approach mm -hmm. after a few years and you can end up by the business being attracted to a different area. And that happens at this moment in time uh, for different reasons. But it's the council that should attract, that should, that should be deciding the relief, isn't it? The council should be empowered to decide what they want to do with the business rates. Through, through, through the bill, that's basically bill, yeah. what's being proposed. Okay, thank you. Thank you thank very you much. Cameron, thank you. John Wilson, please. Good morning, gentlemen. The, put this question in context so you know where it's coming from. Uh, the Public Petitions Committee received a petition from a local resident uh, in the West End of Glasgow. Uh, raised issues about the growth of the large retail sector, uh, bas basically uh, Tesco metros, the Sainsbury locals being created and uh, the high streets and town centres to the detriment of some of the smaller traders. 
Uh, we examined uh, the petition. Uh, we looked at the planning aspects to see whether or not it could be dealt with through planning. But one of the arguments that's come back uh, to the committee is that maybe it would be better dealt with under Part 8 of this legislation. That, that is to deal with uh, the encroachment on the town centres or high streets by those types of stores. Uh, do any of you have any comments on how we or whether or not this part of the, the bill, proposed bill could take on board the community's concerns about the growth of uh, the Tesco metros or Sainsbury's locals or whoever else uh, coming into an area uh, and decimating the, or potentially decimating uh, local traders in a, the high street. Mr. Mandel? I think what's at the heart of the problem, and I think that there's different stages. Uh, if you go back in time, uh, there's been a big focus on uh, out-of-town centre type uh, developments with the bigger stores, and I think that's had a bigger impact on town centres uh, more than uh, the sort of Tesco metros or uh, even Scott Mid and people like that who are, are developing a different product. Uh, <clears throat> I, I do see that uh, that can have an impact on small businesses. Uh, uh, to be honest, in my mind's eye, I wouldn't necessarily be using the, the proposed powers in this bill to assist the Tesco metros. I'd be looking to try and assist a local butcher, for example, to develop uh, in the, uh, the town centre, on the high street, in our small towns, etc. Uh, I would rather use these powers in that way uh, and be selective and focused to try and attract smaller businesses, as yes, opposed sir. to the, sort of the, the national networks like Tesco's, uh, Tesco metros, as you've mentioned. Mr. Clark, um, I, I think certainly there are fairly wide powers uh, potentially uh, for local authorities within within the bill. Um, I, I mean, clearly they could be used to to address um, and to incentivise uh, specific business activities within a specific area. And I think, you know, that's why uh, this particular. I think that's where this fits in to um, the overall uh, business rates agenda, because clearly you've got at a national level, national reliefs, um, you've got, uh, you know, as we mentioned earlier, the enterprise areas. I think this is, this is a lot more local, a lot more specific to local circumstances and can be fine-tuned uh, a, lot, a lot better at a local level. Um, and I think that's, that's the attraction uh, in it. Um, certainly in, in our membership, we've certainly found um, in the retail side, uh, independent stores um, faring reasonably well over the past couple of years. They've been uh, um, uh, growing fairly strongly in many circumstances, and that's extremely welcome. Uh, and there's various reasons uh, for that. I mean, people are perhaps moving away from supermarkets, particularly for you know meat, etc., um, in the wake of various um, scandals which which have blown up over the over the piece. And that's been to the benefit of uh, of smaller independent uh, retailers. But um, I think that's the advantage of, of, of the powers within this bill. It, it allows um, a local authority to take specific notice of specific local conditions right down to you know, potentially an individual street or a particular community within a local authority area and target that uh, area to um, help to incentivise and support business in that area. Mr McCafferty, please. I, I agree with much of what Mr Clark has said there. The only uh, rider I'd put on it is that I, I question whether the amount of rates that's involved would be sufficient to dissuade uh, a truly determined large organisation. Mr Wilson. That's no further questions, Commissioner. Thank you. Mark McDonald, please. Thank you, Commissioner. I noted in some of the... Um, submissions that came in, there were some concerns around the application of local tax reliefs, or rate reliefs rather, having to be fully funded by authorities. To me, it strikes that if we want to encourage local flexibility, with that should come the local responsibility as well. Would that be accepted by the panel? Mr Mundell. I don't think there's any issue with uh, uh, certainly Inverclyde Council or indeed the community, our local uh, Inverclyde Alliance uh, to take the responsibility or indeed the accountability for doing precisely what you've outlined. Uh, I, I, I mentioned earlier on, I think in this particular case, there are other 
mechanisms that can be used uh, by grants or whatever to particular communities. And indeed, uh, some of the, uh, the communities, uh, part of the bill deals with assets and all the rest of it, as you know, and uh, uh, there are different ways of, of, of dealing with that through, through grants. But uh, there's no issue in terms of the accountability with the Inverclyde Alliance uh, and, and I'm sure any other community planning partnership. Mr Clark? No, I think, um, I think if a local authority uh, has, has a power to, um, to uh, reduce business rates in its, its area, then uh, clearly that could be a, a cost to that, that local authority, and that's right. But I think the business rates incentivisation scheme uh, ought to be um, geared in such a way as that it, it, it allows that local authority to at least benefit in part uh, from uh, the encouragement of enterprise within its, its area. Mr McCafferty, please. I think what we're seeing is local authorities concerned with the overall picture of funding and uh, they're, they're concerned with anything that they see as additional costs when they're, they're relatively convinced that uh, the current settlements might be under under threat in the, over the next uh, few years. So I think, think that's one of the drivers for, for the type of response. I think maybe also in some areas, of course not in the Clyde as, as we've heard, but in some areas, this, this partition of two communities uh, may, may cause the local authority to lose focus on the fact that there is a direct benefit if it works. Yes, Mr. Mandel. Uh, perhaps I've misunderstood the question. In terms of any increased cost or whatever, uh, there are a number of issues uh, through this particular bill that I do have concerns about in my opening comments uh, about uh, uh, the local authorities or indeed uh, uh, the community planning partnerships. There are, I think, uh, yet to be determined in detail significant costs associated with uh, delivering on this particular bill uh, once it's approved, etc. Uh, and, and it's back to building the capacity, the hand-holding that's required, developing the skills within the communities, and indeed some of the assets that uh, will have to be dealt with or transferred, or indeed transferred back in again if, uh, if one of the community groups uh, fails. There are significant potential costs associated with that yet to be determined, and that is a, a serious concern, certainly from my perspective. Well, Looking at it from, I mean, I, I'm by no means an expert on Inverclyde and where Stuart McMillan here, he, he might drill down into this more, but obviously Inverclyde is not too far away from one of Scotland's very large population centres. I represent uh, a, a constituency within the city of Aberdeen, but I don't represent the city centre itself. So th there is obviously local flexibility within local authority areas as well as to where rate relief is applied so it need not be on a on a full local authority basis it can be targeted to specific areas so if for example within Inverclyde there was a, a feeling that investment needed to be attracted to a specific area then a rate relief uh, approach could be taken for that specific area rather than having to be applied across the whole of the authority area so um, I take on board the point you make around the, the potential, if you were to apply it on an authority-wide basis, that there, there would then be a significant potential shortfall in terms of rates. But the, the targeted approach that is offered uh, surely provides some attractions to authorities such as yourself. Yes. I've said already that uh, it's, a, it's a, a tool that could be uh, used to advantage. Uh, I've also mentioned that I think there's different methods. But I would like to comment with regard to the closeness to Glasgow. Uh, I was actually supposed to be at a meeting uh, with the chief execs and leaders uh, through the city uh, region uh, for Glasgow this morning. Uh, and that is a different level altogether where uh, all the councils within the Clyde Valley are working closely together. Obviously, there's a billion pounds worth of investment over a number of years uh, uh, tied to that. Uh, and all these issues of uh, business incentives uh, will be examined and have to be examined to make sure that one council area is not disadvantaged more than the other. But the whole concept of the city deal in this particular case is to be is to look at that region and improve the economic vitality, the gross value added uh, uh, outcomes uh, for that particular area. So it's not just at a local council area and indeed down at a local community area. Uh, we have to consider these things. We have to do the joined up bit, which again this bill is trying to do to make sure that all the partners join up and work closer together. I think we've made big strides forward already over the last few years since the previous legislation came in, but there's always more that can be done. Um, I, I wonder, uh, gentlemen, if you see 
uh, any advantage for councils to to actually consult with business improvement districts um, if they intend to use this power? Mr Mundell. Well, well, again, the main thrust of this particular bill is consultation and engagement with different communities. In our area, we, we do have the Chamber. We uh, honour the Community Planning Partnership. Uh, we engage with the Federation of, of Small Business. Uh, and there's different uh, engagement type mechanisms that are used. That's another issue as well. Local authorities uh, are, are required to engage and consult on a whole range of fronts. Uh, I've seen through some of the literature that I've read and, uh, before I've come here, uh, references to CLD uh, consultation, uh, children's services consultation. There's a whole myriad of different levels of consultation. And the bill itself talks about uh, consultation with community bodies. Uh, I'm particularly uh, keen on ensuring we consult with the communities themselves rather than just the bodies. And there's another point I would like to take the opportunity, steal the opportunity in reality, uh, to, to raise a point too. Uh, we're being challenged uh, through this bill, quite properly I think, in terms of improving community engagement. Uh, I do wonder, in terms of the national outcomes, for example, how the Scottish Government actually engage with the communities uh, to ensure that they develop the, the most appropriate outcomes up at that level. Uh, obviously, we have to engage to ensure that we have come up with the right uh, uh, outcomes and uh, performance measures, etc., at a local level. But there are different levels there, and I just think we're potentially missing a trick in terms of the national outcomes as well. Thank you. Mr Clark. Um, I think it's an interesting one. I mean, obviously, one of the premises of, of, of bids is a, a small supplement on uh, the business rates um, payable um, uh, in order to, to, to fund the scheme. Um, but uh, certainly, I see no reason the number of business improvement districts in Scotland is, is growing, um, and I would see no reason why they shouldn't be part and parcel of the, uh, the consultations um, in terms of the application of, of any of the powers under the, uh, the bill. Mr McCafferty. I think uh, the consultation works very well with bids at the moment, but taking Mr Clark's point up about the, uh, the supplement, of course, uh, where there are issues with it sometimes is not everybody in an area is in a position to participate, and so there would be an opportunity uh, with this relief, I believe. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Mr Rowley. I think Mr Mundell raises a number of issues in his submission that I think will be useful to the committee. Um, obviously, today we're focusing on part eight, but um, thanks for your submission. It will be useful, I think. Um, finally, um, you, uh, I think it was Mr Mandel that said that uh, this power would not be the silver bullet, but it is uh, something that could be used with a basket of, uh, of other powers that local authorities have. Um, can you... Do you have uh, any uh, ideas of, of change that could be made to the provisions as they stand in the draft bill uh, that would make the power more likely to be used within that basket of other opportunities that are out there in terms of incentivisation? Mr Mundell? Uh, specifically in relation to the business rates. Yes. Uh, Well, the only thing that uh, probably that really concerns me is 100% uh, relief uh, for businesses and how that would impact on the council financially. Uh, so so that, that's a, a particular issue I would like to see addressed in some way or another. I couldn't give you the specific answer in relation to that, other than to say that uh, if within existing resources, our partners are working closer together to apply these to remove duplication. You mentioned that earlier this morning. And, and absolutely the case. That needs to be uh, developed further in that sense. But in terms of this type of thing and any of the other additional cost burdens within the bill, uh, uh, we, we don't necessarily have the cash to deal with these at the moment. But I can't give you a specific in terms of a, an improvement other than being aware of that particular concern. Mr Clark. No, as, as I've said earlier, I think, uh, I think the key is, is to, to ensure that the business rate incentivisation scheme is working correctly at a national level. Uh, but I very much see uh, the powers within this bill as being something which can uh, be used at a very, very local level. I mean, there are other ways of, of, of applying reliefs uh, nationally, uh, which the Scottish Government has control of. Um, uh, across uh, rated properties in, in, in Scotland. I think the advantage of this scheme is it can operate very, at a very local level uh, to address very specific needs. Um, it does not need to be hugely uh, expensive for the local authority, 
But I think it would certainly help if the business rate incentivisation scheme was set up to allow the local authority to benefit from increased economic activity in its area. Thank you. Mr McCafferty, please. I think that in, in year one, there, there, there's every possibility that there'll be a, a, a low take-up. I think after that, if, if the situation is to make it more um, transparent within the budgetary setting process, that this is available and that the councils are to consider it and maybe even uh, have to take petitions with regard to it. At least it would give a transparency that might help its uh, take-up in future years. Very much. Uh, can I thank you, gentlemen, for your evidence today? Um, I suspend and we move into private session. Thank